Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Kukuchka from the State Library of Queensland, and I would like to welcome you all here tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Turrbal people and the Yugara people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. Before we start, can I please remind everyone to switch off mobile phones. Um, also, if you need to leave at any point during the talk, please just use the back exit. And there are bathrooms on levels two and three. Also, um, we are recording this talk. Uh, we're audio recording it, and we're audio live streaming it as well for anyone who can't be here tonight. So um, if you have any questions about this, please just come and see me or one of the staff afterwards. So we are very pleased to present tonight's talk, Reading to Children with Mem Fox, as part of the National Year of Reading. The National Year of Reading 2012 is about children learning to read and keen readers finding new sources of inspiration. It's about supporting reading initiatives while respecting the oral traditions of storytelling. And it's about helping people discover and rediscover the magic of books. And most of all, it's about Australians becoming a nation of readers. There are programs, events, and resources available all year round, so visit the lovetoread.org.au website for more information. This event also celebrates State Library's current exhibition, which is called Look, the Art of Australian Picture Books Today, which is in the SLQ Gallery just here on Level 2. It's a beautiful exhibition, so please take the time to come and visit it um, and experience the artworks and share some stories with the children in your life or perhaps just your own inner child. So today we are very privileged to have Australia's most highly regarded picture book author, Mem Fox. I'm sure everyone here knows Mem's name from her books that we all hold very dear to our hearts. Mem was born in Australia, grew up in Africa, studied drama in England, and returned to Adelaide in 1970, where she has lived with her husband Malcolm and daughter Chloe happily ever after. Mem's first book, Possum Magic, is the best-selling children's book ever in Australia, with sales of more than four million. In the USA, Time for Bed and Wilfred Gordon MacDonald Partridge have each sold more than a million copies. Time for Bed is on Oprah's list of the 20 best children's books of all time, and Mem has written over 35 picture books for children and five non-fiction books for adults, including the best-selling Reading Magic, which is aimed at parents of very young children. Her recent book, Ten Little Fingers and Ten Little Toes, was on the New York Times bestseller list for 18 weeks in 2008-2009, and it won the best book for zero to three-year-olds um, at the International Book Fair in Turin in its Italian edition. And Mem was also the Associate Professor in Literacy Studies at Flinders University in Adelaide, where she taught teachers for 24 years until her early retirement in 96. She has received many civic awards, honours and accolades in Australia, including two honorary doctorates. And she has visited the United States more than 100 times, mostly in her role as a literacy expert, although she's also obviously a very well-known author in America as well. And she's an influential international consultant in literacy, but she pretends to sit around writing full time. Her latest book is A Giraffe in the Bath, and she hopes four-year-olds and over, including adults, will adore it. So joining her tonight is State Library's own literacy expert, Jodie Finucan. Jodie is currently our Acting Executive Manager of Literacy and Young People Services. And she's worked in the education, arts, culture and heritage sectors for the past 15 years, developing programs, policy resources in the areas of social and cultural history and literacy. And Jodie's work has included developing visual literacy programs for children in schools and developing learning objects and touring programs for the Queensland Museum. And more recently, Jody wrote the literacy indicators for all Queensland schooling sectors to support planning for teaching, learning, assessment, and monitoring of literacy from prep to year nine. And her interests are in the role of reading in developing creative and critical thinkers, as well as historiography and literature. So together, tonight, Mem and Jody will discuss with us the significant issue of reading to children. Research shows that reading to a child from an early age contributes to language, critical thinking, and literacy development. Half a child's brain growth occurs between birth and age four, which makes this a crucial time for us as parents, carers, and educators to foster a love of reading, illustrations, and stories with children. More than any other skill, the ability to read allows a child to succeed in school, 
to learn about the world, function in society, and someday participate successfully in a workplace. Yet despite all this evidence, studies have also shown that in Queensland only six out of 10 children are read to regularly at home. So obviously we have almost a full house here tonight because we're all passionate about reading to children and, and wish to learn more. So following our conversation, there are gonna be opportunities for audience questions and we're also recording this talk as I mentioned earlier. So wait for a microphone if you wanna participate in that. And also if you wanna join our conversation um, via Twitter tonight, there's a, a hashtag here on the screen that you can use. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mem and Jody to share with us their insights into literacy and development, as well as their expert ideas and tips on how we can make reading an integral part of life from infancy. Thank you, Jody and Mem. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mem. I'm personally very um, pleased to meet you. And it's very exciting to be here and to hear you talk today. And I thought for the audience we might start with the question of what do you think is the most important aspect of research that underpins how reading creates creative and critical thinkers? Do you know I don't want to talk about that? That's okay. <laughs> I actually don't she did tell me I was about to go on a very wild ride and I said, that's totally fine, I'm very excited. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you why I don't want yes, to talk about absolutely. that. Uh, because I keep reading things in the national curriculum. I read... Um, statements, you know, uh, set out by libraries. I, I read um, information about a night like tonight. And uh, everywhere, everywhere, in every one of these frameworks or pieces of information, I look for two words that I can never find. One of them is love, and the other one of them is fun. I never see those two words. I see, I feel a weight of heavy, burdensome duty. <laughs> that we have to read to the children in our lives, because if we don't, they will go to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So really, I think um, Jody, um, poor Jody, uh, she's had a terrible job tonight, this poor woman. I, 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 I feel terrible for her because I've just gone miles away from your question. But I would like to, I would really like to focus on the joy of it. Absolutely. I, I really want to focus on the love, the joy, the delight, the hilarity, the squidginess, the kissiness, the laughter, the bonding, the cuteness, the things kids say about books. It's, it's so fantastic, you know, reading to a kid. It's so fantastic. And people keep talking in this sort of, well, we've got to do it kind of voice. No, no, we haven't got to do it like that. If that's our attitude, the kids won't like it either, will they? You know, they'll think it's awful. So what was your question, Jodie? I think my next question is, so how do we make children love reading and what sorts of things do we do with children to give that joyfulness to reading? Right. And not make it a burden. And not make it a burden. Okay. God forbid that reading a book should ever be a burden. Um, one of my colleagues in Melbourne, I live in Adelaide, but a university colleague in Melbourne, David Hornsby, whom some of you will know, says that he's always amazed on a plane at how many people can sit there without reading a book. He says, what have we done to people that we have made reading so horrible for them? What have we done? And I think one of the things that we might have done is a sort of, is something that, um, is that we haven't started early enough before kids are cognizant of anything. We haven't started early enough. If we start early, the earlier we start, the hookeder they become. I know there's no such word as hookeder. The more hooked they become, okay? Um, I, I'm sorry this will be a recurrent diversion all evening, but I now have a grandson. It must be obvious to you from the haggard look of my face that we care for him every day. Um, <laughs> he's now two. When he, was, when he was born, he was a kilo. He was one kilo. His hands, his arms were the size of this finger. And I thought, my God, how will this child live? How will he thrive? And because of this book, which is my 
I think, the best thing I've ever written in my life. And I hope I'm remembered for this rather than possum magic when I cark it. Um, <laughs> but because of this book, and having written it many, many years before he was born, because I know about brain development, because I know about bonding, because I know about language development, because I know about literacy, I freaked because this child wasn't in his mother's womb after 30 weeks. That was it. He had 30 weeks. And I thought, oh God, you know, when children are in utero, they hear all sorts of things. Now, you know, they're with their mother all the time. They're hearing all sorts of noises. They're hearing language. They're hearing television. They're hearing the radio. They're hearing conversations between adults. They're hearing so many things. I thought, how will he develop he, his brain? Up? Oh. <laughs> Poor thing. All alone in his little human crib. Just lying there this big. Well, of course, I'm Mem Fox, and so I was a bit embarrassed you know, about going to visit my grandson because Adelaide's a small place and everybody knows who I am. Well, nearly everybody. I feel that everybody knows who I am. I'm always embarrassed when somebody says, you Mem Fox now look like a dag. You know, I want to say, well, not today, I'm not. Anyway. <laughs> but I was embarrassed about reading to him because I felt that I was drawing attention to myself because nobody else was reading to the Premier Babies. Nobody. Nobody was reading to those children. This is the smallest copy of any book that I have, that I have written myself. It's the tiniest copy. So I didn't choose it because it was brilliant. I chose it because it was small and I could sneak into the ward without <coughs> drawing attention to myself. You know, I could just pull it out, open the little round window. Little one, whoever you are, wherever you are, there are little ones just like you all over the world. And I read him this book for two and a half months. Every single day, I read him this same book in the same lilting rhythm, the same rhythm, the same tones, the same pauses, in all the same places, because I wanted him to love me. I wanted him to hear my voice and love me. I also sang to him. I sang to him every day a song that I had made up from a book that I had written called Ten Little Fingers and Ten Little Toes. The song is on YouTube, should you wish to hear it. I am embarrassed to say that I had the courage to do that. Um, <laughs> and the reason I did it, the reason I read to him, and the reason I sang to him, and the reason I talked to him, and the reason our daughter did the same, and my husband did the same, was because we loved him and we wanted him to love us. But we also knew that out of that love and out of that experience of reading, we would be ensuring that this beloved child, our only grandchild, will he be our only grandchild, will not fail. He will not fail to learn to read. Because there are members in my family who have failed to learn to read, who have been in and out of prison, uh, as, as is very common with illiterates. You know, they end up in the justice system. Uh, the contrast between those children who've been read to and those who haven't is absolutely heartbreaking. A pediatrician stood beside me one day when I was reading to Theo, and he said, I wish more parents and grandparents would do what you're doing, because as a result of what you're doing, you will see this child will thrive. He'll thrive. And when Theo was in hospital last year with asthma, unfortunately, at the age of almost two, the pediatrician said, what did I tell you? This kid's language is incredible. I cannot believe the way he talks at the age that he is. And he's two, he's tall, he's healthy, and he's on his way. Apart from inheriting his grandmother's chronic asthma, he will be okay. But that's why... We have to start early. Absolutely. Because that kid was trapped. He couldn't get out of the human crib. There was no way he couldn't, he couldn't escape. And once they can crawl, seven months, we've lost it. <laughs> Except at bedtime. Because when, they, when they're crawling, there's a world out there, you know, it's exciting. They, they shouldn't be sitting all the time being read to, they should be exploring the world. But if we can get in there early, they're totally hooked on books. 
And this is the boy we're talking about, and a boy who could have been brain damaged because he was so tiny. Absolutely, that's mm. a, a lovely story and an example of how children should be read to in utero and as soon as they come into the world. Mm. So, so um, what do you think are some techniques that parents could use in reading to children to make children like a joyful celebratory experience right. when they are with the children in those reading times? Right. Um, I think... I think that if we have fun, I mean, it's got to be fun for us. And um, I, I can't bear the phrase, be expressive, because that has a whole lot of connotations of a particular training, a particular personality. But I think if we use the word zest, which is one of my favorite words in the world, if we read with zest, <laughs> then children will tune in. You know, they'll, they'll get the hang of it and, and they'll love it. A man heard me speak one night and I was, at the, I was at his daughter's school the next morning, and he said, I went home after your talk, and I read completely differently to my daughter. I just hung loose. I didn't care. I just hung loose. He said, man, it was fun. I didn't realize it could be so much fun. And my daughter's attitude was completely different. And my attitude is completely different. I loved it. I loved it. And it was just because it was joyful. It was joyful. The other thing, uh, so joy is the first thing. It's got to be joyful and full of zest. Not, not to be too boring. But the other thing is to read the same books over and over. I mean, sometimes you just have to because they demand it. But to read them over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because the familiarity also is what brings them back and back and back to the book. Now, the first time you read a book, they're not familiar with it. And my husband once said, oh, he doesn't like that book about Theo. He doesn't like that book. And I said, how often have you read it to him? He said, we read it this morning. I said, so you've only read it once? And he said, yes. I said, well, he doesn't know the book yet. He doesn't know it. He'll love it. He'll eventually love it. So, you know, the over and over and overness, I mean, sometimes kids don't like a book and they'll, they'll just tune out. The other thing is, of course, uh, the other thing that, that is a good thing to do is when you've read millions of different books to children is to allow them to choose. You know, you take out, say, six books at night or whatever and say, what about... No. What about... No. What about... Sometimes he says, well, very often he says no to my books, which is very hurtful. <laughs> he doesn't know which side his bread and butter is on or whatever, whatever that phrase is. He doesn't know that it could be cut out of my will with just a swift thing of the pen. Um, no, he doesn't want that. No, no. Okay. You say a particular book? Okay. You know that they can actually choose the book. The other thing is to always read the book in the same way. Never change the way you read it. Because children who can learn to read easily and quickly do so because they have the rhythm, the rhyme, the structure, never changing like an advert on television. They can almost sing the book in their head. So we're not singing the book, but we are reading it with the same tune all the time. We're never changing the tune. Um, there are 10 read aloud commandments on my website, memfox.net, and there are hints in that that I can't recall at the moment, but there are many other hints about, about reading to kids. Let, let, me, let me take... I brought some, I bought some favourites. I, I gritted my teeth and bought some books I didn't write. Now, we could easily, with Harry McClary, go like this. Out of the gate and off for a walk went Harry McClary from Donaldson's Dairy and Hercules Morse as big as a horse with Harry McClary from Donaldson's Dairy. <laughs> Out of the gate and off for a walk went Harry McClary from Donaldson's Dairy and... Hercules Mortz as big as a horse, and 
Harry McClary from Donaldson's Dairy. Bottomly pots all covered in spots. Hercules Moles as big as a horse. And Harry McClary from Donaldson's Dairy. It's zestful. We're having fun. We're not thinking, oh my God, I've got to read Harry McClary again. <laughs> We're thinking, yay! How fantastic, Harry McClary. And because we're reading this kind of book over and over and over and over and over again, amazing things happen. Like, you know, he's 18 months old, a, a black and white Dalmatian goes past the playground and he looks at the dog and it's huge, it's a very big Dalmatian. He looks at the dog, I look at the dog and I say, Theo, that dog is huge! And he says, bottomly pots! The things they learn from books is, it, it, just, it just staggers me. It, it, it absolutely staggers me. For example, he got for Christmas a sailing boat. Very small, wooden, with a little blue sail. On Christmas night, in the splashing of the bath, the boat fell on its side. Immediately, I wasn't in the bath, I, I don't do the bathing. Immediately, he said, Mayday! <laughs> and my husband came downstairs and said, I'm sorry, but Theo is a genius. <laughs> Theo's a genius. Do you know what just happened? The boat went over and he said, Mayday. He said, I didn't know what Mayday was until I was about 25. <laughs> and I said, it's Terry Denton. It's Terry Denton. It's in one of my books. A particular cow. A cow jumps into the, a boat, the boat nearly goes over, and the people in the boat say, Mayday! There's no genius about it. It's just because the child has been read to, and it's so nice to do it. As children get older, do you think that questions should be asked in before, during and after reading to build comprehension or that should be the role that happens in schools and not just at home? I don't think it should happen at school. No? I don't even think it should happen at school. What quicker way to kill the love of reading than to ask a question before, a question during and a question after. If I were about to start Charles Dickens's a Tale of Two Cities, and somebody said to me, what do you know about the French Revolution? I'd say, bugger off. <laughs> you know, I just want to read the book. I just want to read it. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I just want to read the ending and sob. I just want to read the book. There is no greater teacher than the book. No greater teacher. My father was the most gifted educator I've ever come across. He was unbelievable. And one of his maxims was, which I have lived by as an educator, stop teaching and let the children learn. It is the passion for books. It is the passion for reading aloud. You know, people say, oh, reading aloud is just too easy. It won't do anything. You know, it's like the school principal who went in to hear a friend of mine teaching in America, who came, as, came in, she's a year, year eight teacher. She came in, that's high school, uh, in where she is. I mean, I don't know whether it is here, but anyway, year eight is high school. He came in and she was reading a long novel to the kids, and they were absolutely wrapped. He came in for an appraisal. He crept up to her and he said, I'll come back when you're teaching. <laughs> you know, when we read aloud to kids, they pick up general knowledge, which we need to be able to read with. You can't read unless you know about the world. They, they offer, if it's, if it's big books, they're picking up print. If it's novels, they're picking up language. You, you, can't, you, you have to have print, language, and knowledge of the world to be able to read. And we keep interrupting that by saying, no, no, we've got to teach them. They won't understand the vocabulary of invisible before we read Potter Magic. Children, do you know what invisible is, people will say before they read Potter Magic? If you read Potter Magic, you find out what it is in the context of it. You know, we kill the love of reading with our questions. We kill it so much that our daughter, who was, 
you know, became a journalist, then became a teacher, and now for her sins is a politician in South Australia, <laughs> which is why my husband and I are so exhausted. Um, for, because she loved reading so much, because she loved English so much, we were shocked and shattered when she went to university and said, I'm not doing English. I'm not going to do English. I don't want literature ruined for me. Now, that is a ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous attitude. She didn't do English, you know. She did French and anthropology. She didn't do English, and I think she lost something by not doing English. But she didn't want literature wrecked for her. She instead, all her, most of her friends did English, and so she read all the set books. She read all the books, but she didn't want to pick them to pieces. She didn't want to have a postmodern, um, postcolonial stamp put on a book. She wanted to read the book for the, re the, the, for the reason that the author had written the book, which was before comfort, enchantment, thrill, horror, pity, empathy finding out about another world, meeting different people, going to different times, going to different places, all of these things wonderful books provide and teach us. And we kill it with some of our teaching and some of our aims in school. We kill it. We should just be reading to kids over and over again, particularly the children whom we ask to read to us, the failures, the strugglers, who come up to our table and say, I hate reading because my legs hurt, because they stand there for so long, struggling to sound out a word. Those are the children that we ask to read to us. And those are the children whom we, read, we should be reading to, because they are struggling because they haven't been read to. And they, won't, they will continue to struggle until they have been read aloud enough to. They will continue to struggle. We cannot skip that read aloud part of children's lives. We can't. You know, the first, I, I get so angry, and my, I, my daughter's a politician, as I've just mentioned. I get so angry with politicians because they keep talking about education revolutions and blah, blah. It doesn't matter who's in power. They're all for it. They're all for it. Starting from the day kids go to school, we're going to do this, they say. We're going to remediate from the age of five. For heaven's sake, people, it starts at birth. It doesn't start at five. Five is five years too late. Am I getting passionate? I'm going to think about this tonight when I go to bed. You know how you go through your event? And you think, you were really over the top at that point. <laughs> and I'll be embarrassed for myself. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. So I can almost guess what your answer is going to be, but I'll ask the question anyway. <laughs> um, when we have the statistics that our educators and ma mainly our educational bureaucrats drive to us that children have low, have high literal interpretation skills but um, very low inferential um, interpretation skills and they can't track meaning through a text and they don't understand or can't, you know, pronoun reference and all of these other things which means that they're not making meaning of the sense. world mm. and making sense of the world and they can't then read to learn and build on that knowledge in a mm. particular discipline. What would you say to that? <laughs> what else can you do but read to them? They haven't got the grammar. They haven't got the knowledge. They haven't got the print. You know, we need to read to them. And beyond reading, when they have to read for themselves and then start comprehending, and we have those questions we have to ask in an educational setting, and we suddenly realise that they don't have the inferential comprehension, what would be some strategies you Look, would suggest? I'm sorry, but you have to read to them. There's a wonderful book called, um, I can't remember the name of the book, the author is Daniel Pennack. It, it's, it's not Such is Life, because that's a famous Australian novel, but it's something like that. And uh, he's, he's French, mm -hmm. he's a French educator, and he is also a famous French author, but he chooses to, he chooses to, to teach yeah. failing adolescents. And the way he teaches them the way he gets them to do those sorts mm -hmm. of things and to answer those sorts of questions, mm -hmm. which in a French system, 
are even more prevalent than they are mm. in ours, um, is, is by reading aloud. It is an absolutely inspiring book. Mm -hmm. These kids are rough. They have, um, a, a lot of them come from non-French speaking backgrounds. Uh, their, their French language is bad. They have no uh, literacy in their home language. Mm -hmm. And he just uh, sets them alight by, by the way he does it. We can't, we can't do, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. These kids lack so much. And one of the things that they lack is the fire. <laughs> you know, they've no fire for literacy. They've no fire for books because it's always been such a horrible experience for them. You know, somebody has held up a book called The Magic Hat when they're five and asked the dumb question, this, is a, this book is called The Magic Hat. What do you think it might be about? <laughs> I mean, what are people thinking? What on earth are people thinking? Orientating the child towards the book. You know, Theo in his humid crib got no orientation to the book. He got no orientation. Sweetie, this book is called Whoever You Are. It's a very beautiful book. It's about humanity. Now, having told you that it's about humanity and it's called Whoever You Are, could you possibly guess what this book might be saying to us as human beings. You know, we, when I used to watch my, my darling own students on prep teaching, um, I'd see them, you know, the kids would, you know how as student teachers think they, they're going to get silence? You know, they, they think they're going to get silence. <laughs> so they wait and they wait and they wait and you know, they've got near silence which is when they should jump in and get going, but they, but they wait until there's... They're never going to get it, and their kids are rabbling and rabbling, and then they start asking questions and talking and doing anything but the book itself. The moment the story starts, there is no discipline problem. The moment the story, the whole point of it, the moment the story starts, there is no discipline problem. Because we are wired to love stories. We are wired to love them. You know, I, I used to love teaching in schools that my students were teaching in. I used to love going in on a Friday afternoon. And my students would think she's going to fail. She's a uni lecturer. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She hasn't taught for years. <laughs> and you just start, you know, you tell an Edgar Allan Poe horror story. And it'd be a total silence. <laughs> I remember doing it once, telling, um, I think it's called The Beating Heart. I'm not sure, but it's about a beating heart anyway that's under a floor after somebody's been murdered. And um, <laughs> there was a year, year nine girls, and there were two kids in the second row, and I could, and I, th th nobody was breathing. I mean, they were going blue in the face. Um, <laughs> And one of them grabbed the other's wrist and said, Oh my God, it's the heart. <laughs> you know, the stories get us every time. They just get us every time. I tell you, when, when I was a lecturer at, at Flinders Uni, I would attend the lectures that my co colleagues gave, obviously, you know, because we were all teaching in the same course. I needed to know what they were saying. They needed to know what I was saying. I would sit in the lectures. I would sit with the students. And every time a lecturer said, you know, last week when I was at the supermarket, suddenly all this kind of, it's a story. Last week when I was at the supermarket, mm -mm -mm. As soon as a story happens in a lecture of any kind, you know, a brief story like that about literacy or whatever it is in the lecture, a story is what grabs attention. It's astounding. The whole physical attitude of everybody, you know, I could see heads moving in front of me, I could feel bodies changing beside me because suddenly there was a story. And we try to kill stories, you know, by doing too much with them. If we just damn well got on with the story, we'd be so much better. So, ma'am, you wouldn't be a fan of deconstruction of, of the narrative <laughs> at all? So, when I was at university, yes. one of the fascinating things that happened to me was, obviously, I read The Great Gatsby. Yes. And I'd read it as a, a young teenager and thought it was a fantastic novel, and then my lecturer said to 
to a group of us. How do we know that what happened to Gatsby really happened? And I was like, because the book said it, you know, things happen to Gatsby in the book. The book describes what happens to Gatsby. And he said, no, the narrator of the Gatsby is Nick Carraway. And how do we know he's a reliable narrator? And suddenly all these questions came with how an author, and then reading F. Scott Fitzgerald and some of his memoirs, how an author constructs a certain reality. And I was blown away because the Gatsby had already just been a story about Gatsby until I started to look mm. at the way he'd constructed narrative voice. No, I love that kind of stuff. You I love, love that? It. Oh. I love that. And it's therefore the so, questions... It's so exciting. That you would ask and a good children? teacher, a good teacher can be absolutely inspiring. Yes. Absolutely inspiring and set you alight with things like that. I remember when I was an adult student um, uh, at Flinders at, at, mm -hmm. um, just before I was a lecturer, and I, we had an inspiring English professor, and he was talking about um, Pride and Prejudice, which is a book I think I had read many, many, many times. And I was so orgasmic over what this guy was saying, you know. And I was almost sort of sinking in my seat. I was going, oh, 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 that's fantastic. You know, it was so exciting. What he did was so exciting. Yes. But I was at a certain point in my life. Mm -hmm. I wasn't five years old. Yes, I absolutely. wasn't 13. I wasn't, you know, yeah. I, a brilliant teacher can do anything with a book. So when should we introduce concepts like semiotics and things to children and, and the ideas that of, of certain multiple meanings and things like that? When, when they're the way National older? Curriculum says we have to. <laughs> then, then some of those things will never happen. We all know that. <laughs> We've read those documents. Yes. <laughs> um, Another question I'd like to ask is about vocabulary. Yes. So obviously there's a lot of um, research gone on on how we build a child's vocabulary from the early years of reading mm. to them. So I was wondering what your perspective was on how we broaden children's vocabulary and also um, is it just reading that would broaden their vocabulary or as some teachers do do that out in schools and early childhood educators do certain vocabulary building games. And what do you think of that? So I'll give an example. I have a seven and eight year old mm. who at the moment are obsessed with watching um, Kira Knightley's Pride and Prejudice. They watch it over and over again. I don't know if I should admit that. But they're obsessed with that. Hopefully they'll start reading the book. Um, they're only seven and eight. And when we leave the house, we'll say things like, it's a beautiful day. And as we're walking to the train station, it's a fabulous day. And so we start the game mm. going on how many descriptive words they can um, come up with for the day that all have a similar, you know, mm. meaning. Are there any other things other than reading to children that you believe build vocabulary? Um, this in here, this book, which yes. I reread today on the on the plane because I wanted to be, I wanted to have it fresh in my mm. mind. I can't believe it's um, 11 years old already. Uh, and I, I did read it on that trip, so it took me just two hours. To, to read it, and I do have ideas in that. There are lots of ideas. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I say in this book, and I reiterate again and again and again for parents, is not to teach their children to read mm -hmm. before they're five, not to teach mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Children will often learn to read. Yes. They'll often learn to read, but we're not teaching them. So what I'm describing here um, in, relation, in relating to um, you know, picture books and so on with very young children are that sort of game. Mm. It's that sort of game. Mm. If it's a game, it's okay. It's fun. If it's fun, it's okay. Another of my father's maxims was, a laughing child likes to learn. So if it's fun, it's all right. Okay, yeah. fantastic. With um, vocabulary building with children and then working into um, how children tell their own stories, do you think that children should be encouraged to narrate and tell their own stories from a very early age because the oral storytelling builds on that sense of readership? I don't... I you don't, know the whole talking to babies and letting yes, children tell you their stories? Yes. And they make them up and it's fantastical yes, and it doesn't matter, so yes, suddenly the you know, walk around the park yes, becomes something very yes. dramatic. 
Look, what children want to do. If it's led by children, yes. Whatever it's, if it's led by children, it's okay. Yes. You know, it's okay. Even if, and God forbid that this should happen, but I'm reading a book, that Theo's current obsession is a terrible book called Elephants. And some of you who are as old as I am may remember reading to your children books that were called McDonald's Starters. They were non-fiction with little red um, things around the edge, you know. Well, not only are the books out of print, but the publisher's out of print as well. <laughs> okay, long gone. But they were non-fiction books, oh. and uh, they were all non-fiction. And this was Chloe's book, Elephants. It's, it's terribly badly written. But Theo's absolutely obsessed with it. He is obsessed with this book. And uh, your question was, sorry, if... Oh, yes. Um, at the back of the book, at the back of all the McDonald's starters, was a vocabulary list. And when we get to the end of the book, which is about woolly mammoths, having lived millions of years ago and there are none left anymore, that's the last, that's the last page, you immediately see this word list. And he looks at it. And I won't have a bar of it. I mean, what if he, you know, if he shows an, a deep interest in it, then I will sh say, you know, there's a map of Africa and it says Africa. But I would never say that's Africa. That is a map of Africa. Can you say Africa? Let's look at the word. It says Africa. <laughs> because in the word list, in the teaching of that word list, where's the joy? Mm -hmm. Where's the love? Where's the emotion? I mean, on one page of elephants it says, the leader of this herd is very old. The young elephant fights him. The young elephant is leader. The old elephant goes away. And the picture is very sad. And uh, both Chloe and my husband think I should rush over that picture because it's deeply sad, that page. But Theo finds it very, very moving. He gets terribly upset by it. And we'll read a few pages beyond, and then he'll say, leader of the herd. And we have to go back to that page and back and back and back to this sadness. And I say, he's an old elephant, darling. He's gone into early retirement. He was very, very tired. And he's so happy not to be the leader anymore. And he says, he was very, 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 very tired. I say, my darling, yes, he was very tired. He was very tired. And then we read on and, and he'll get very, very upset on that page. And I'll say, if... If you don't like that page, Theo, we can always turn the page. We can turn the page. You don't have to stay on that page, ever. You can turn the page and, and things will change, which is my, now my philosophy of life as well. <laughs> if you don't like the page you're on, just turn it, you know. <laughs> just turn the page if you don't like where you are. But in a word list, that heartbreak that he is experiencing on that page, that that desire to go back and back and back to that book, that desire to go back and back to this dreadful text, that desire to go back and back to experience the sadness will never be found in formal teaching of a word list. No. Never. But if he initiates it, for example, this is a little distressing, I'm ashamed of myself. Because in this book I say, don't teach your kid, I'll kill you. Okay, I will kill you if you teach your child to read. Many of you at Christmas time will have read, I'm sure, to your young children, the Dick Bruner book called The Christmas Story. It's a beautiful rendition in Miffy form, you know. Uh, he's the Miffy person. It's a long book. It's a landscape-shaped picture book. And so it says The Christmas Book all along the front. The Christmas Book. And it's such a long title, and it's such a long book, that sort of like, you know, late November, I was just going, the Christmas book, with my finger, the Christmas book. And if I didn't do it, he would then say, which could be construed as a very rude thing, it could be construed very badly, but he would say, do finger, do finger. <laughs> so that I would have to go, the Christmas book. And then he would put out his hand, and I would have to do finger with his finger. And now, increasingly, he is asking me to do finger. Do finger. 
And the other day we were, you don't have Foodland here, it's a, it's a supermarket chain that is in, you know, pathetic com you know, uh, competition with Woolworths and Coles and losing badly. But Foodland is our closest supermarket. So two days ago, there's, it's in a boomerang, Foodland. It looks like an Australian boomerang, very identifiable. And I said, we're at Foodland. I said, that says Foodland there. That says Foodland. And he said, do finger. Well, it's a huge sign, you know. <laughs> and there were, you could see me from the car park, you know. It looked as if I was teaching my grandchild to read, and it was so embarrassing. But he said, do finger, what can you do? <laughs> You'll do anything, they ask. So I went, Foodland. And he said, do finger, and put out his own hand. And so we went, Foodland. So we went inside, and he was, you know, re well, reading numbers and things, and seven, aisle seven, and things like that. And then one of the guys who knows him, who's a packer in the, in the shop, because uh, we go there all the time, said, hello, Theo. And I said, Theo can tell you where you work, Reg. He said, he can't. I said, he can. I said, what does that say, Theo? And he said, Foodland. Of course, Reg thought he was pretty clever. I said, it's OK, Reg, I only told him five minutes ago. <laughs> you don't have to get overexcited. But he, that's, that's coming from him. Yes. I, I know I did it on the Christmas story, but his desire to know, because I think he knows now that there are things called words. I mm -hmm. think he's got a, an idea that there are things called words. But you were talking about vocabulary and the fabulous and all yes. of that. Yes. We put, as many ev as all of us do, I'm sure, put a tablecloth or a sheet over the edge of the dining room table, and he makes a house out of it and you know, plays under there. And one day we had just a menagerie under there. I said to him, oh, Theo, you've got a fantastic house there, sweetie. Your house is great. And he said, yes, it's a very fine dwelling. <laughs> And now I'm going to forget the title of the book. I think it's called Clancy and Millie. Clancy and Millie, who wrote it? Uh, Libby Gleason. Libby Gleason. I knew it was a famous author. Okay. And because he loves that book, and it's about two kids moving house, a, a child moving house, having no friends. There are huge boxes that the fridge and other things have come in. He and the girl next door make friends, and they make houses out of these huge empty boxes. And the mother is describing the new house to him, which he doesn't like at all, as a very fine dwelling. And so when these two children make houses out of boxes, they say to each other, it's a very fine dwelling. And I always emphasize it and do it kind of camply, you know, it's a very fine dwelling. <laughs> so of course, you know, how could a child of 20 months say it's a very fine dwelling without having been read to it? It's impossible to conceive. They couldn't do that. No, absolutely. And yet we want at school to make a, a, a vocabulary list that had the word fine in it, dwelling. Sight uh, words. Sight, sight words. word list. And yeah. you think, people, please, please don't kill it. Is the sight word list for orthographic development, though? So that they know how words are spelt, or no? Look, if it's fun, yes. if it's done in, a, if it's and there's there are ways of teaching anything yes. yep. that are as dull as ditch water and take the kids nowhere, and that are that that exactly the same method can be done with a different teacher, different attitude, different zest, yes. a smile on the face, a game, and the kids learn it, and it's fun. So let's move to reluctant readers. Yes. In lots of early childhood centres and in, in schools and in the education system, children do those little readers, you know, and often, mm. you know, um, as um, I've advised in the past, you know, do picture books, do meaningful books, don't mm. just do those little readers. Right. Um, but there's often a rule in schools that you have to go through a certain level of reader until you're rewarded with the chapter book. So you can't have a chapter book until you get to a certain level. And so children who are reluctant readers or deemed poor readers look at that mythical chapter book coming up. And my own daughter came home and said, mm. you know, I have two more levels until I can get to Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe. So there's the treat for the children who are already very good readers. And the other children have to struggle through the levels, hoping, and maybe sometimes they never make it to the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. 
And we well, wonder why children fail. Um, we wonder why they tune out. And of course, as a mother, I go and oh. say, you know, I write a note mm. saying everyone should have mm. line the witch in the wardrobe. Mm. Because my youngest, though, she, when she couldn't read and was read to, would say things like, you know, she's very little, you know. I'd say something like, oh, you're very little, you can't do that. And she'd say, mummy, you know, I may be small, but my heart is large, <laughs> from Despero. Oh. Um, so we wrote a note to say, you know, please allow... Evie mm. to read a chapter book. Uh, why does she have to jump through certain hoops to get rewarded with the chapter book? What would you think about the scenarios of making chapter books almost um, unattainable for some children? Uh, appalling. Yeah. Beyond belief that anybody in a curriculum office could put that down as mm. a way of teaching. Mm. It's about a child's interests. Mm. It's about a child's development. Some children will never want to read the, child, the, the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe because they're not interested in fantasy, mm. because they're not that kind of child. Mm. But the child, but to say you can't do this until you do that. Mm. I start reading magic with this story, but um, Chloe learned to read within two weeks of being at school. And I was shocked, I, I was ecstatic, I knew nothing about the teaching of reading at the time. And so she was, reading, she was reading picture books very quickly at home, uh, you know, quite complicated books, uh, really, really well, with a lot of expression. I met my husband at drama school at Figures, mm. okay. So um, <laughs> she would come home with her readers from school. Uh, it, was a, it was a Catholic school, and uh, my husband was teaching there, which is why, why she was there. And she would bring these readers home, and she had to go let, lockstep through the mm, series, mm. okay? So she's reading with expression, complicated picture books. She comes home with the reader and she goes, Sam and Pam and Digger went to the park. Sam threw a ball. Sam threw a ball. And, and I said, why are you reading like that? <laughs> What on earth are you doing? <laughs> and she looked at me as if I was from the dark ages and I had no idea about modern schools. And she said, you have to read like that at school. That's the way you read at school. <laughs> and I laughed so much that she burst into tears. Now, I come from a missionary background, which is why I grew up in Africa. And this was a Catholic school, OK? We're not Catholic. But one way or another, we don't lie. It's not one thing that we like to do in our family. We're not liars, OK? So um, I said to her, Chloe, you're not reading these readers. You are not going to read these readers in this house. I will not have it. I will not have it. I said, I will read you the readers, and I will say that these pages have been read, but not by whom. Not by whom. And I said, we are going to whiz through until you get, you know, to some decent books. There were no decent books, because it was readers. I brought one with me. Hang on a minute. This is an English reader, because I didn't want anybody in Australia to get upset. Um, OK, just let's, just let's hear this. OK, just let's start this. I won't go far. Each peach pear plum, I spy Tom Dum Tom Dum in the cupboard, I spy Mother Hubbard, Mother Hubbard in down the cellar, I spy Cinderella, Cinderella on the stairs, I spy the three. Yes. You can read <laughs> okay, the play. This is the reader. Biff and Chip went to school. They went with Whiff and Wilma. Biff and Chip liked Mrs. May. They were in her class. Wilf liked Mrs. May. He was in her class too. It was story time. The story was The Wizard of Oz. It was about a girl and her dog. The girl was Dorothy. There was a storm. The wind blew the house away. It is so boring. It's so boring. And if kids have only readers, if that's their experience of literature, no wonder we have illiterates like the poor child in my family who ended up in the justice system because he never learned to read. It, I mean, he can read now enough to get a driving license, which he has. 
but he ran away from school because he was laughed at at eight and a half because he couldn't read. Because he wasn't read to. It's so simple and it's so joyful and it's so yummy and scrumptious and delightful. And when people say, I haven't got time to read to my child, I don't know why they have them. It's 10 minutes a day. It's three books. It's the same three books. It's the same book three times or three different books. It's 10 minutes a day. If you've got a child at home and you're living with it, it can be three hours a day during the day. It can be three hours. And for people to say that a boy of 24 months cannot sit still for 40 minutes listening to books, you know, we need to raise our expectations. Mm. This, this is about to be reissued because it's out of contract. It's not out of print, it's out of contract, so these people have to buy it again from me, which is thrilling. <laughs> but they would only buy it again if I wrote a chapter from my perspective as a grandmother, because it has been so amazing what has happened. Because I didn't know anything when I had Chloe. <laughs> you know, I knew nothing, it was all by instinct. And now I know what I know. I know about brain development, language development, reading development, and so on. And I have been so surprised <laughs> as the author of this book. Even as the author of this book, I thought, oh my God, look at what this kid can do. Well, of course he can do it. Why am I so surprised? I keep wanting to hit myself on the head with, you know, <laughs> this is, you wrote the book. You wrote it. Don't you remember what you wrote? Don't you remember what you believed in? Um, the reason why I want you to buy this book this evening is because when it's reissued, it's going to be twice the price. <laughs> and you can get the grandmother chapter in the library. You don't have to... <laughs> You know, you don't have to wait to pay $15 for one new chapter, you know. I wanted this to be well under the price of a packet of cigarettes. I said, I want this book to be cheap. Please, please, please try and keep it under $10. They, they just can't. Costs have gone up. So it will now be, you know, $14.95, which is, for me, heartbreaking. Um, I, you know, I, I don't need to make money out of this book. I make money out of other books. I, I just want the message out, out, out. I, I, I just want the message out because we could change the world if this happened. We're damn good in Australia, by the way. We are fabulous about reading aloud. When you said, you know, no, it was the, the, um, the first person who spoke mm -hmm. uh, who said only six out of ten children in Queensland is read aloud to. Only? Six out of ten kids in Queensland is read aloud to are read aloud to. How fantastic is that? That is brilliant. I mean, it's sad that it's not 10 out of 10, but 6 out of 10? Man alive. We are hot. <laughs> it's fantastic. We do a brilliant job. Brilliant. But we can always do better. Absolutely. So I might um, ask if anyone in the audience wants to ask you a question now, ma'am, since I've asked you some nice, you know, curly ones, curly ones, um, and ask people to get the microphones around the um, room if anyone wants to ask Mem a question, um, and just wait for a mic, and we'll hear from the the audience. Thanks. Hi, um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, reading to your children versus making up a story for them. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter, I read to her every night, um, but lately she is all about just make up a story and, you know, she calls them pretend stories. And she, she wants that more often than being read at the moment. I'm just wondering about your comments on, on that. I think that's absolutely wonderful because there are no pictures. And if you're just making up the story, then her imagination is, is having to work you know, twice or three times as hard to create the pictures herself. So it's doing absolute wonders for her, her imagination. Wonders for her imagination. And I think that's absolutely fine. It's a point in her life when she wants that. It's, um, it's about uh, a closeness between you and her. You're still with her. It's not all about literacy, it's about bonding. <laughs> 
you know, it's really about bonding. I think everything comes out of the bonding. All the, all the education, the language, the, you know, the psychology, it all comes out of bonding. So that's what's happening. It's a, it's a lovely closeness. I think that's terrific. Um, I, I didn't mention either during this discussion that um, telling stories is, is absolutely terrific, you know, with no book at all. I don't do any of that, even though... Oh, I do sometimes, actually. I, I know the story of... I know lots of stories, because I used to be a storyteller. I do tell the story of Epaminondas sometimes to him, and I know some of my books by heart, like Koala Lu, so I can tell those without the book as he's sort of drifting off in the, in the dark. Uh, but Chloe, his mother, tells him... Uh, she has three stories, Chicken Licken, The Three Little Pigs, and Red Riding Hood, she, which she tells, and she says, which one do you want? Which, how about, is what we always say, and he goes, how about, how about, and then says the one that he wants, and I think that those, he's never seen pictures of those three fairy stories. He's never seen the pictures. So it's all in his head, and I think that is really, really fantastic and very, very important. You know, Einstein was asked by a woman how she could make her child clever, and he said, read him fairy stories. And she was kind of thought that was a brush off. You know, she was irritated by the answer, but she was very polite. And she said, and after I have read him fairy stories, then what should I do? And he said, read him more fairy stories. <laughs> so what you're doing is terrific. Do you like it? Oh, See? How gorgeous. Lucky you. We might just take I have them. a question. Um, I was just wondering, is it the same to read to children um, from an iPad as it is from a book? Because iPads are everywhere now, kids are using them, they're so young. Um, will they get the same benefit from reading an iPad book as they will from a real book? It's not about the iPad or the book. It's not a competition between those two things. It's, it's whether there's an interaction between an adult and the child. The iPad's just a thing. The book is just a thing. So the difference, there is no difference between those, except that, more often than not, because children can manipulate an iPad, more often than not, they're left alone with an iPad. That's the danger, that the loving interaction, you know, it's much more important to learn language than it is to learn... Uh, familiarity of letters. It's much more important to learn language uh, before you go to school. And there are four-year-olds across society, among the wealthiest kids in this country and among the poorest, there are four-year-olds who can't talk. And they can't talk because no one's reading to them and no one's talking to them. A television cannot have a conversation with a child. An iPad cannot have a conversation with a child. An iPhone can't have a conversation with a child. The other thing, the other thing about the iPad and the book versus the book is, if I were Einstein, I would say, if you want your child to be really clever, then use books more often than iPads because the book, by its nature, because it's only a book, Will, in, will inculcate a level of concentration in a child that is going to be extremely valuable later on because they'll be able to concentrate at a, for a long time at a high level without requiring some breakup. You know, if you're on an iPad, and I have seen this with Theo, there's so much excitement. You know, there's so much excitement that there's no concentration. You go for the pelican, and then he says elephant, and then you find the elephant, and then you find the elephant, and they're going, woo and then you do this, and then you do that, and there's lots of stuff on it, and it's exciting, and the fingers go in and out, and they get bigger and so on. But where's the concentration level? But, you know, even watching television in our house, we try to watch television with him. The only time he watches it by himself is when his poor mother, who is a single parent, there's a story. Um, 
when his mother is having a shower because, you know, there has to be a point where she's on her own. And he does watch television when she's in the shower. But the rest of the time, whatever it is, TV, iPhone, iPad, book, it's the loving interaction with the child. I mean, just this morning, I was lying on my stomach on the floor. He was sitting on a very low um, child's couch thing, you know, that you'd buy for, from Kmart for $9, that kind of ch chair. And so my head was at the level of his knee. And while he was watching television, he was patting the back of my head. He was just patting the back of my head. Honestly, I just wanted to put my head right on the carpet and sob. It was so beautiful. So, and then we could interact also, you know, when something was scary on the television or whatever, or Wiggly Pig or whatever it was, you know, you could interact and say, no, it's not scary, and, you know, it's going to, you know, we've seen this one before. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. Do you want me to put your hands over? Shall I put your hand, my hands over your eyes until it's over? No. But it's the interaction. It's the love between the two adults, the adult and the thing. Doesn't matter what that thing is. I love technology, myself. Hi, ma'am, over here. Hello. <laughs> I just um, wanted to get your thoughts on children asking questions during the story, uh, particularly stories that have quite a, a melody or a rhyme associated with them. Do you feel that it breaks up that rhyme and that you lose some of the, the meaning behind the story, or do you think that it actually builds on the story? Um, I used, to, uh, I used to teach my students as I wanted them to teach, okay? And, you know, there are all sorts of OH&S things that now that you, 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 you know, just couldn't do what I was doing in the past. <laughs> but I would say, look, I'm going to read this story for the first time. None of us has heard this story before. It's so beautiful. I'm going to light a candle. No way could you do that these days. I'm going to light a candle. And once the candle is lit... We cannot speak until the story's over. Nobody can speak until the story's over. So that children get the logic of this started, then because of that this happened, then this happened, the problem wasn't solved, so they had to do this, then the problem was solved, then they lived happily ever after. And they get sequence. They, get, they also get the grammar of the sentences, they get the vocabulary, they get the emotion. There is no interruption. Thereafter, for the third, second, third, and fourth reading of the same book, because I never read a book once during the week, you know, with little kids, I would always encourage people to read them, you know, seven or eight times during the week. So they want to talk, they want to ask questions. Fine, the second, the third, and the fourth time, they can ask questions, break it up, break it up. They can sort things out, they can ask everything that they don't know. And then on the fifth and subsequent readings, nobody talks because they don't want to, they don't need to. They just need the story again. But I never let them interrupt the first reading. Never. I have sometimes, it's much more boring, put an apple on the table and said, while the apple is here, nobody can speak. Nobody. Are you ready? Are you watching the apple? Everybody look at the apple. <laughs> One fine day from out of town, etc. Um, I hope I won't offend anyone with this question, but it's important to uh, me. This afternoon I was teaching in a low socioeconomic, racially diverse area, and I drove in to the middle of Brisbane to sit in a room full of almost exclusively white, middle-class women. And I'd like to ask you about your thoughts about how to motivate the parents who are not here tonight. The only way to motivate parents uh, to do what I want them to do <laughs> is to read to them to find, so that they can find out how fantastic it is. So, you know, it's got, it's got to be, um, you know, uh, dear parents, one of you will have to stay at home, but one of you can come and have a fun night. This is what, this is what we're going to do. Um, it, it, it's, it could be chaos, it could be this, it could be that. We'll have pizza, 
And believe it or not, I'm going to tell you stories, and some of them are hot. <laughs> and, you know, because a lot of those parents are frightened of schools. They're frightened of buildings that look like prison. They're frightened, you know, they're frightened of buildings that look like police stations. They're frightened of libraries. They're frightened of authoritative buildings. Uh, they're frightened of school. They've had bad experiences themselves. They don't want to be there. So, but it's fun. If we say, well, we're, you know, we're going to run a talk about why you should read to your children. They won't turn up. Why would you? Why would you? Because the word joy isn't there, hot isn't there, you know, uh, fun, laughter, hilarity isn't there, your we yourselves isn't there, you know, none of those, none of that's there. Because we're so, we're so focused on the duty of it. And I, as you can tell from what I've said tonight, I mean, it's the, it's the passion of my life. But, but I try to be, um, I try not to make it sound like you know, you've got to drink eight glasses of water a day, don't eat salt, never smoke. You know, it's not, it's not like that. It's just it's such a beautiful thing. It's such a beautiful thing. So fun, fun, fun. But reading to them, especially reading to, um, you know, parents who are second language learners and so on. Reading to parents, you know. This is when you think, you know, I wish I was the prime minister. Anyway. <laughs> Do we have, yeah, more questions Hi, just up here. Um, I've just got a question about book choices. Yes. I'm lucky to have an eight-year-old boy who is a very avid reader, um, and some of the books he's wanting to read, if they were movies, I wouldn't let him. They would be, M you know, he's wanting to read Hunger Games and all sorts of things that I'm wondering, you know, you were talking about the struggling reader wanting to read a chapter book and they should have open slather. Should he also, or... What are your thoughts on that? Look, I think so. Uh, uh, up to a point. Um, I mean, the sexually explicit books for eight-year-olds, perhaps not. <laughs> but, but really, as soon as we say you can't, then the desire is there. I mean, I was horrified uh, when we were staying with my sister in London once, and my daughter was 12, and she just picked a book off my sister's shelves and it was the colour purple. Well, you know, it starts off with a masturbating scene. And I knew that it started off like that. And I, she was halfway through the book and I just thought, <laughs> too late now. <laughs> too late now. You know, it's a stunning book. It's an absolutely brilliant book. But I wouldn't have wanted her to read that quite at 12. I, I just wouldn't have wanted that. But I would never, I couldn't, I, I was so torn because I didn't want her to read it. But I didn't want to say don't read it because if I said don't read it, she would want to read it ever so much more. The quickest way to make somebody read a book is to say you can't read that book, it's banned. You know, my banned books in America, you know how Americans ban books left, right and centre, they love to ban a book. My banned books sell so well. Because <laughs> everybody wants to read them. Why is this book banned? Uh, I actually had two questions. Uh, I've got an 18 month old uh, and with your grandson Theo, how do you find, you were talking about concentration, keeping their attention on the book? Because I find she's wanting to just flip the pages so I'm, I'm speeding through the book to try and get it read before she closes the book and we're right. on to the next book. Look, we just do what they want to do. We just follow them. You know, if she wants to speed through the book, that's okay. When you're in the car and you know the book off by heart, she's strapped in the back, she can't move. <laughs> you know. Just start to recite it, because you, you, know, you know it by heart and they can't move, so. Because it is important that they get eventually, but you know, between 12 and 18 months, that is a developmental stage where they don't want to sit around. Uh, it, it's completely the time of exploration between 12 and 18 months where they really are wanting to zoom around and, and it's, it's uh, more difficult, you know, to... But I would never worry about anything, you know. It, it, as soon as we start worrying about anything before they turn five, they will pick up on that worry and then everything will turn nasty and it'll all be horrible and... Mm. My second um, question was just... Um, no, just whatever she wants is fine. 
You were talking about tone for reading. Yes. Um, we read to, to bed for her as well. So do you sort of dull it down for bedtime reading or do you still use the same zest? <laughs> Our daughter Chloe used to say to me, I don't want him overstimulated. I don't want him overstimulated. But you know, you can do the magic hat, which is, oh, the magic hat, the magic hat. It moved like this, it moved like that. It spun through the air like a bouncing balloon and sat on the head of a hairy dada! And you're both shrieking. But then you finish off with, it's time for bed, little mouse, little mouse. Darkness is falling all over the house. The stars on high are shining bright. Sweet dreams, my darling. Sleep well. Good night. You know, it's just the book will say what the tone's got to be. But I want to make them happy as well as sleepy. <laughs> I, my, well, I, I love reading, but English is my second language. So when I read to my kids, I, I'm reading with a very strong accent. So I'm a little bit concerned that I'm not sure if I should be reading, really, to them. Oh, <laughs> you should be reading to them. It doesn't matter what accent you've got. It's not about the accent. It's about the love. Remember that. It's about the bonding between you and your child. You know, all they want to be is with us. They just want to be with us. And what, you know, if we can just focus on them for a little time every day, that's all they want. Do they care that you've got an accent? Of course they don't care. We all have an accent. Every single one of us has an accent. I'm always amused in America when people say, I love your accent. And I say, and I love yours. I don't have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> the accent is immaterial. You know, they hear English at school. They, they'll hear lots of different Englishes at school. You know, they'll hear rough and tumble Australian. They'll hear received pronunciation English from their teachers, which is, you know, sort of posh and more literary, uh, literary kind of way of speaking, a more correct way of speaking. You know, it's about them loving you and you spending the time reading to them to hell with how you sound. It doesn't matter at all. Sorry, I was transfixed. <laughs> Hi. Um, we've always read to our children all the time, but I now have an 11-year-old daughter who's torn, and she says, Mum, none of my friends have books read to them anymore. Should I, you know, so we've sort of pretended and said she doesn't have to tell anyone I read to her. <laughs> but she's still feeling a bit whether she should be a bit more grown up and not have books read to her. Look, she's obviously at a stage where she's just moving away, isn't she? She's just moving away and you're so damn lucky it took until she was 11. Because when Chloe was six and, you know, was a fluent reader, and of course your child was probably a fluent reader about the same time, she, she knew what she was going to do. She was going to wound me mortally. She knew what she was about to do. And so she was incredibly tactful. And she said, Ma, um, I can read it faster by myself. <laughs> and I never read to her again. I never read to her again after the age of six. It was heartbreaking. She thought she had got rid of me, but actually... Because I couldn't read to her, when the light was out, I would kneel by her bed with my elbows on the bed, you know, with my hand like this, and we would just chat. Uh, I was absolutely sure that I was not going to be banned from that heavenly nighttime event, you know, and that went on, that chat went on for ages. I remember when she was in year seven, and I said about one of her friends, do you think so-and-so, so and is going off the rails? You know, <laughs> and we had a long chat about whether this child was going to end up being a juvenile delinquent. Um, <laughs> it was that kind of chat, it was the chat about values, about life, about behavior, about, you know, I, I remember in this position when she was about uh, 13, I said, why don't you take drugs? because um, some of her friends were already doing that, and she said, oh, because I'm a leader, not a follower. I thought, oh, my God. Um, so those times were so important, I couldn't bear to get rid of them. So you're so lucky, and there are people 
who will allow their parents to read to them until they're 17. You know, at, just at night, just to be read to. How fantastic. The bonding. The development, the brains of these children must be incredible. Lucky you that it's lasted so long. And I also just, sorry, just wanted to say uh, one of our most special things that we used to do was we had one of your CDs. And on a Sunday night, that was a, if everything was done, we could sit and listen to a few, and it was great. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the CDs worried me, and I'll tell you why. Because they're okay in the car, I guess. But I was worried that people would put on the CDs and have Mem Fox telling the story uh, without interacting with the child, that the CD was going to take the parent away. Uh, so if, if everybody's listening, that's okay. I was, I was terribly worried about the CD. I thought, oh, will this mean that parents don't read to their children because it's not about you know the stories, it's about the love and the bonding and so on. Well, I'm glad you liked them. Thank you. Oh, look at this child. How old is it? Three months. Oh, how did she get here? <laughs> how did you manage it? Ten out of ten. Thank you. He's not asleep yet, though. Um, I just, I'm a speech language pathologist and have um, an intrinsic interest in, in preschool children's, particularly language and, and literacy development. Um, and I run book groups for babies where it's the mums that attend. Um, and one of the very frequent comments is that they do the lion's share of most things, uh, sorry, reading, and um, that they want to know how to encourage their partners or a male figure in their life to take equal part in that reading. And I just wondered if you had any stories or comments about that. Um. Um, I'm not selling this book. I don't. I make you know two cents out of it. You know. I mean, really. So I'm not selling it because it's not worth selling. You know, it's too cheap. In this book, there's a chapter called Boys and Reading. I think it may be the last chapter. Um, yes. There are some absolutely heart-rending stories about times when fathers have decided, for various reasons, to take on the role of reading to children. So there are, I think, probably four really, really powerful stories at the back of this book about what happened when fathers began to read to their children. What happened to the children? What happened to the fathers? It's just, I was nearly crying today on the plane because it was the last chapter. And, you know, I, I know this book really well, but I hadn't read it for a long time. And I just read that story and thought, oh. So, you know. Borrow it, you don't have to buy it. It's in the library. Hi, ma'am. Hi. Um, I've uh, been reading to our children. I've got a five-year-old, uh, nearly six. He'd kill me if I said five. Um, nearly a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And we've been reading a lot all through, like, from when they were tiny. What I've seen since he's, he's started school and he's gone into prep and he's starting in grade one is that we do get the readers that says, the hat is brown, the cat is brown, you know, that, that sort of thing. And I can see that he is not enjoying it, and I don't enjoy it, really. And it's, But it seems to be that th there is a requirement to go through this thing. Now, I've heard things about when they read chapter books and that, you know, we had the Muddle-Headed Wombat series, we've read all of that, mm. you know, Peter Pan, or, or books that perhaps are perhaps a little bit too old for him, mm. but he's loved them. But what I'm seeing at the moment is that he's str he's struggling with it and and it's not interesting to him. So we sort of scoot through whatever he has to do for school and then go and read something that he wants to read. But I just am a bit concerned that, you know, maybe we're not doing the right thing in terms of his, you know, the way, the way that the education is, is happening. Look, I... I in three years' time, I will be in your position. I feel as if Theo is my child because we look after him every day. He's not. It makes my daughter furious. But anyway, <laughs> um, I care for him. She has no... She cannot say a word, you know, otherwise I'll say, well, 
send him to childcare then. No, no, go on, send him to childcare and pay for that. Um, Theo will be at school in three years' time, as of now. Will he learn to read happily and quickly and easily with a lively teacher who's teaching reading in a way perhaps not prescribed? You know, what will happen? How will I cope? What will I do? You know, as Mem Fox, I, can't, I, I will not be able to go to the school and say, guys, this isn't working. You're teaching like crap here. <laughs> you know, this is not working. This, this highly literate child, you know, who can read books, uh, who loves books, and who's been read very complicated, wonderful texts all his life, is absolutely not learning to read because of the text that you're using. What are we going to do? I can't do that. You know, because I'm too well-known, I'm too out there. I, I, if I go anywhere near the school, everybody will come out in a nervous rash. I won't be able to, you know, be like a normal grandparent or parent. And I'm terrified that exactly what you're going through is what he'll go through. You know, the first teacher a child has can make up for a child not having been read to for, for, for the first five years. A brilliant teacher can make up for that lack. But a bad teacher in the first year of school can undo also a lot of the goodness that has happened in that first five years. It, it's really scary. And I need to tell you that there was graffiti at Flinders University in the third floor men's toilets. And when the boys fell in love with me after a while and knew they could tell me, year after year they would come and say, Mem, did you know there's graffiti about you in the third, third floor? men's toilets, and I would say no, because I always did no, but I'd say, no, is there? What do they say? It says, Mem Fox is not God. <laughs> I said, well, how wrong can they be? <laughs> uh, but I'm telling you that story because I don't have the answer. I am not God about that one. I, I have no idea what you can do. I honestly do not know what you can do. It's so depressing. It's so frightening that this damage can be done. Um, I think you just you, you have to go through the motions prob probably, but just rush it, get it over and done with, make a joke of it, make a running joke of the, you know, start talking in school reader language. I am eating my wheat bix. What are you eating this morning? You know, just just so that we just laugh our way through it. I, I, did to dis I did discuss it with Chloe philosoph philosophically. I said, school is something you have to get through. I said that to her all her life. And, you know, sometimes she had brilliant teachers. It was just so inspiring that she just sang the whole year. And sometimes it was just, you know, dull and, and very, very, you know, poor. And it happens in any school, private or public. It doesn't matter where the kids are educated. There are some terrible teachers and there's some brilliant teachers. And I would say to her in the terrible teacher years, you just have to get through school. You, it's just one of society's requirements. You know, you just have to do it. So knuckle down and, and just get through it. it. It may be difficult, but this is just, it's, it's not negotiable. And I just want to make a comment to the lady who was talking about getting the partners involved. Yes. Um, I like to think that I'm an expressive reader and that the kids absolutely love me reading to them. Mm. If Dad, who's not such an expressive reader, wants to read them a story, I, I may as well be invisible. So I See, totally encourage that. See, that says that, you know, they, they are desperate for him to be... For, they're desperate for him to be with them under any circumstances. <laughs> Under any circumstance, I totally know where your family's coming from. I can mm. absolutely, I can see it. Because mm. they probably don't see as much of him as they see of you. Mm. Is that right? A bit, or not? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, terrific. And, <laughs> and the I, last question probably. And if it? I could, I'd offer um, an answer to the question about reading to children through readers. Um, I have a colleague who now um, lectures at ACU in early childhood. And he has two small sons and they used to come home to do the readers. And he always said, well, in life we have to do a little bit of work before we can do something that's rewarding. So we'll just get through the reader and consider it work 
and I'll sign it off and then we'll read something that's actually good. <laughs> and so just oh. get through it and then afterwards do something. But what a that's shame that we have to get through it. <laughs> what a shame yeah. that they have to get through it. Mm. How heartbreaking. It's terrible, but yeah. Mm. Maybe one day they won't send readers home. Mm. Mm. Oh. Yes. 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 I already know this talk because I have to follow the line. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to send them home. If I have to send them home, they'll home with their other books. Mm. You know, let, let, and you have to read it. But if they want to say to me, I don't want my child read it, I'll go, hallelujah, read something else. Mm. That's very, very encouraging. Mm. That's very encouraging. <laughs> Yes. Quality literature and quality time with their parents and having to read a home reader is just, you get the kids. Challenge the teacher. Challenge the teacher? Oh, but we're only parents and grandparents. <laughs> Teachers. Men, maybe, maybe you could help us. At our school, we need to conference with the children in prep to find out their reading goals. And the reading goals have to be documented and written down and then read back to the principal in our meetings with him. So could you help me with a four-year-old writing their reading goal? How sad. So is that a part of an explicit reading strategy? Does the school have an explicit their reading? reading goal, what they want to read, how they want to read. Okay. Um, it's our school target in literacy. Mm -hmm. They also need to have a numeracy goal mm -hmm. and a general working and behaviour goal. You know, the goals, the goals are all right, but a child with those, trying to articulate those goals, especially a child who's never been read to, how could they have the vocabulary or the thought processes to understand what you were even talking about? We the do. word goal by itself. Yeah. That is only in football. It's very challenging from a professional point of view and as, um, as I have been a parent, but it is very, very difficult. It's but we sad, are required you know? to do it. It's really sad and I think what happens is that curriculum writers, some were never teachers, God forbid, but some were never teachers, uh, but they're in education, you know, they've got doctorates in education. They, Perhaps some are not parents, perhaps some are totally divorced from children, have never interacted with little kids, that have no understanding of their, of their likes and dislikes and so on. And they sit in offices with, which are airless and in committee and come up with these mad ideas divorced from the vitality of a classroom, the vitality of human interaction in the classroom, completely divorced from it. It's, it's sad. One other point. When my children had readers at school that were very boring, we actually wrote our own text. So we covered the text and we wrote our own. Oh, oh so, so the children wrote their text. My children. Oh, your my children. children. Oh, that's hysterical. And we wrote our own text. <laughs> that's hysterical. Thank you. See, we all have these problems. You were a teacher. You were too frightened to say anything. I was a teacher and I was too scared to say anything. Why are we so petrified of the teacher? Because we don't want them to pick on our child. We don't want them to pick on, and we don't want them to think that we're divas and that we all think our child is a genius because every, every parent thinks their child is a genius. It's tiresome. <laughs> it's very tiresome. Um, and we, we get scared. I, I almost hope I, I die before Theo starts school. I'm so worried. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, the sweat of that first week. Oh, my God. Oh. Dear, oh, dear. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. Sure. But I said to the girl, oh, aren't you having the loveliest time? Look at your lovely cup of coffee and your lovely cake. I said, aren't you having the best time? She was so excited. Because you talked to her. But also, I have to be very careful because I'm a stranger. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I think we should. I think we should talk to them. I think we should talk to them. You know, how old was this child? Right, because I used to be very, very, very cross with mothers. I lived by the beach, and I used to be furious with mothers who had children in pushes and, and were on the mobile phone. But you know, since we've looked after Theo, there's no time to be on the phone. I was ecstatic to be at the airport today. I made about three phone calls at the airport <laughs> because he wasn't with me. It was sensational. So, you know, I, once I had this care of this child, I saw the mother on the phone in a slightly more... Uh, understanding light. <laughs> uh, but I do think that, you know, to be constantly on the phone with a child with nothing to do. Oh, I said I was going to tell you about what happened on the plane today. You did. <gasps> that was part of the wild ride. That the I was wild ride. I to had to talk about what happened on the plane today. I promise this is the last story. Sitting across the aisle from me was a father, a mother, and uh, a child of about 18 months. And, you know, it's only two hours from Adelaide to Brisbane, but your heart sinks, you know, you think, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> oh, 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 what's going to happen here? Oh, no, the child had nothing to do. And you think, oh, what do they expect? The child is going to misbehave because they've got nothing to do. No books, no nothing, not even an iPhone, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the child was, was terrific, a beautifully behaved uh, little boy. And... Um, at one point, he started to get agitated, but he'd been so nicely behaved, you know, prior to that. He'd been so lovely. So I bent down, and I got out of my bag, because I brought some of my own books and some other books that, I, you know, in case I needed to talk about them. I took out of my bag ten little fingers and ten little toes, and I said, you can have this. I don't need it. And she said, are you my fox? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> she said, we love the green sheep. It's his favourite book. And I said, fantastic. Well, here's another one for him. And then I thought, why haven't you got the green sheep on the plane? <laughs> when I looked at that child not interacting with the parents over a book, I did not have this thought. Oh, this was two hours of language development that didn't happen. I did not think, oh, all the brain development that could be happening in this two hours, and they're just wasting their time. I did not think, oh, think of the vocabulary that this child could have learned in these two hours. I just thought, how sad that they're not having fun with a book. That's all I thought. How sad they haven't got a book to have fun with. And, you know, as soon as the book was there, it was read over and over and over again. The child was... Terrific, it was exactly the right level for him, um, you know, and, and he was quiet and they, they had a nice time. The dad read it, the mum read it, you know, then they gave it back to me and I said, no, no, it's yours, it's yours, I don't need it, I don't want it, I never want to see it again. <laughs> um, so it just, just astounds me that people can be on a plane 
for two hours. I mean, it's, you know, some, sometimes I'm too exhausted on a plane to read myself. And I, I did read this. I found it fascinating. Um, <laughs> but to have a child on a plane without a book, or without a colouring in, or a puzzle, or... Why can't, I can't behave for two hours. I get bored in two hours. Of course a child gets bored. So I didn't think of all those formal teaching things which I could have thought of as an educator. I thought of the joy and I thought of the love and I thought, what a shame they're not having that delight. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Mem and Jody. I, I think we're all you know, really hyped up and enthusiastic and wanting to get home and like break out the books whether the kids are in bed or not. Um, but yes, th again, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. And, and thank you all for sharing your stories and your questions with us as well. It's been really insightful for everyone, I think. And hopefully, um, if you want to learn more, we've got some learning notes that we've developed. Our um, learning and um, our young people's um, team has developed some learning notes you can pick up outside if you're interested. And we've got a copy of um, our libraries and literacy document there as well. And um, please do come back and see our look exhibition with some um, illustrations from Mem's book in it. And we hope to see you back here again soon. Thank you.